Okay. Okay, I will be soon. Yes, good. <laughs> nice. Okay. <laughs> so you yeah. are uh, in Queensland right now? Yep. Okay, it's working now. Okay, good. Okay, so I can start. Can I start now or? Uh, wait, uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, okay, the, okay. Yes, the MC will, <laughs> will open it first. Pak Chandra yeah, okay. or the MC will open it first. Okay. We will okay. welcome you first. <laughs> okay, uh, let's begin. It's already nine. Okay. Okay, uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, excellencies, distinguished guests, participant, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, peace be upon you. Uh, good morning. Uh, we are delighted to welcome you to the Artificial Intelligence Seminar uh, Series 6, organized by Faculty of Information Technology, Universitas Yarsi, Jakarta. Uh, selamat pagi, kami sangat senang menyambut Anda pada seminar AI seri ke-6 ini yang diselenggarakan oleh Fakultas Teknologi Informasi uh, Universitas Yarsi Jakarta. This program is funded by Ministry of Education, Culture, Research, and Technology through program kompetisi Kampus Merdeka. Okay, before we start, I want to say hello first to our distinguished guests. Here we have the Rector of Universitas Yarsi, Professor Fasli. We have Dean of uh, Faculty of Information Technology, uh, Dr. Umi Azizah. We also have uh, Head of Information Technology Bachelor Degree Program, uh, Mr. Elan Suherlan. And of course, we have our guest lecturer for today's seminar, uh, Professor Shuli from the University of Queensland, Australia. Uh, this seminar provides a great opportunity for us to learn uh, state-of-the-art artificial intelligence research in the intensive care unit from one of the best or one of the most reputable speaker in the area. Okay, uh, participant, ladies and gentlemen, now we are going to listen to the uh, welcoming speech delivered by the Dean of Faculty of Information Technology, Dr. Umi Aziza. Bu Umi, please. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Chandra. Uh, good morning, everyone. Professor Fasli, Professor Suli, good morning and thank you for intending this session and also the lecture and students of Faculty of Information Technology, Yersi University. And before that, I would like to say thank you. Sully was my supervisor, so I was the student of Sully in 2011 when I got a sandwich scholarship from Big T. I think the moment that Prof. Asli Jalal still in Kementerian, yeah, Prof. in Ministry yeah. of Education. Thank you so much. Yeah. And and today we meet again, Sueli, also virtual. I remember the time, the, the last we met in 2017, and we talked a lot about uh, networking or collaborative uh, collaboration between ERC and UQ. And after that, I heard that uh, Sueli uh, going to China for news, for news of and I heard, I heard from Pak Chandra, and maybe you can uh, give us insight what, what, what kind of AI in industry, because in Campus Merdeka funding or freedom of campus, uh, we have to build uh, industry collaboration. It's part of Campus Merdeka or freedom of, uh, freedom of learning in Indonesia. So we hope that in the future or maybe next year, our lectures and also our students will have an opportunity to have internship in some industry and, and also in other university, especially in UQ, because UQ is one of the QS 100. So it's, it's, uh, we, we really need that. So thank you very much. Suli, thank you very much for a fastly. Thank you. Yes, good morning. Okay, thank you, Bu Umi, for welcoming speech. Now we are going to listen uh, the welcoming speech delivered by the Rector of Universitas Yarsi, Professor Fasli Jalar. 
Okay. Uh, firstly, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry for too many speeches, uh, Professor Lee. This is the Indonesian <laughs> way. <yeah. laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, uh, I am really honored and, you know, welcome you to come to this uh, uh, serial uh, six yeah, of our artificial intelligence uh, seminar uh, because uh, your uh, contribution to this area is already well known by us and by many other part of the world. So we do hope by collaborating with you, by uh, having insight uh, from you about the, what is the challenge in developing the artificial intelligence uh, in the future, because we are the medium-sized campus in, in Indonesia, uh, located in Jakarta, and we have uh, close to 6,000 mm -hmm. students, heavy on medicine and health sciences, and we have just established 450 beds of hospital, one of the most sophisticated hospital in Jakarta right now, with helipad uh, on top of the roof. And then, We are starting already uh, because we received a lot of uh, COVID patients uh, last time, and we have more than 1,400 uh, COVID patients, uh, you know, uh, served by the hospital. And we are now in the process of publishing three articles from that. And then because of the uh, Dr. Chandra uh, research and idea in developing artificial intelligence, we are now working with hospital. We have two hospitals actually, one uh, uh, general hospital, uh, and then second, the special hospital for uh, mouth and, and teeth. Yeah, this is uh, because we have the faculty of dentistry also. So in that regard, uh, we have also cooperated with the, we have the special center for genomic and they are quite good in bioinformatics. We have one of the noted uh, professor in Indonesia uh, dedicated to bioinformatics. Uh, she is from genetic, gen genomic uh, originally, but then uh, very interested in the bioinformatics. So we have now established a, a magister of the biomedical sciences, and we are now uh, in the process of getting the special permit from the ministry to advance into the uh, PhD program in biomedicine. And then we are going to establish the uh, biomedicine for undergraduate. And by developing, uh, because we have Prof Chandra and we have uh, one PhD graduate in, in mathematics, and we have uh, three at least uh, expert in bioinformatics from medical point of view. And we have now, uh, uh, you know, cooperation with you and others. And we are thinking about starting to establish a bioinformatic as the S1, but also uh, having the very strong uh, center in the artificial intelligence uh, with, with uh, few of the multidisciplinary approach from medicine and then from the mathematics or data science, uh, because we have also the one of the study program dedicated to the Uh, science, information science. Yeah, maybe not very close, but can be combined as such. So bioinformatics and uh, related to artificial intelligence will be one of our uh, future endeavor. So thank you, Professor Suli, for your time and your contribution to Pachanda and to Bu Umi. And we do expect to have a, a long-term cooperation with you and youth institution. Again, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, welcome to, uh, to this seminar. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Prof. Asli. So besides uh, attendance from the uni Universitas Yarsi, we also have uh, distinguished guests and attendance from the Yarsi Hospital. So we have the General Director of Yarsi uh, Hospital, Dr. Mulya Di Mukhtar, and also the General Director of Yarsi Dental Hospital, uh, Dr. Uh, Liana Zulfa. Okay, for documentation purposes, we would like to invite you to the photo session. Okay, so please use uh, the virtual background for this, this seminar and we will have uh, one minute for the photo session. So Mr. Taufik will, will take the picture. Okay.
So please uh, open your camera, use your virtual background and smile, and Taufik will let us know when he's done. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Slide one. Slide two. Slide three. Slide four. Slide five. Okay, done. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taufik. So we are now continuing uh, our seminar to the main agenda. That is to hear the guest lecturer, which will be delivered by Professor Shuli from the University of Queensland, Australia. I will read a short biography of him. So Dr. Shuli is a professor in Data Science Division School of Information Technology, uh, the, uh, University of Queensland, Australia, and honorary professor in the School of Medicine, Griffith University, Australia. Uh, his work on big data analytics uh, has attracted wide attention recently. For example, he was listed as one of 50, the most powerful people in Australia. Wow. On big data by the Financial Review. His research interests are in database management, data analytics, and intelli uh, intelligent information system. He has over 200 publications as monograph, edited books, book chapter, and journal conferences with Google Scholar citation uh, over 7,000, uh, I check the citation is by today, 7,165 and H index uh, 46, okay. Uh, he has successfully supervised 32 PhD student to graduation as their prin uh, principal supervisor. In the University of Queensland, he taught many data science related courses, including advanced database system, web information system, cloud computing, and data mining. Okay, uh, if any of you have a question, you can type in the chat or raise your hand after the uh, lecture. Without further delay, please welcome Professor Shuli. Hello, Shuli. Hi, thank okay. you. So Good. I start uh, sharing the screen now. Yes, please start. The stage is yours. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you for invitation. And uh, I wish one day I will come to Jakarta Yase University to do the collaboration with all of you. Yeah. <laughs> it's my, <laughs> it's my, uh, how can I say, it's my good experience. I have been to Jakarta for a couple of times, but I've never been to Yase University yet. And uh, I hope to do the further collaboration with your teams and also do this uh, health related research. Okay, so let's uh, just uh, start my uh, presentation. And uh, I would talk about uh, artificial intelligence in ICU, particularly about a project and the UQ has, uh, the Vice Chancellor has recently allocated about $3 million called the UQ uh, Collaboratory. And uh, one of those projects uh, in the prioritized uh, list uh, is the AI in ICU. So we are actually doing this uh, by a team of uh, people here. And uh, Robert Boots is a uh, director of, a uh, uh, deputy director of ICU in Royal Brisbane Hospital. And before we go to the technical detail or into the health related things, probably I gave you just a very brief introduction. What do we mean by AI? So I call it a roadmap of AI. So AI is just a process of perception, cognition, reasoning, and take action. And nowadays, a lot of applications using AI technology can have an even better performance than human experts. And we have a lot of examples already demonstrated that. And the so-called perception, cognition, reasoning, action are actually in different phases, as you can see from this picture. On the bottom, we call the data visualization. And on the left hand side, we have a perception. That means we collecting the data, do the fusion of the data, and the data, 
are all in multi-modality, such as uh, text, values, pictures, videos, time series, and all possible ways we can collect in the data. After that, we do the machine learning, and that is uh, pattern recognition, and the discovery of the rules, patterns, and uh, also we use the neural network to train the data and find out uh, actually the model of the reasoning model. And after that, we call the reasoning and the taking action. According to the Greek philosopher, Aristotle, he said a human being has a four different types of the reasoning patterns, deduction, induction, abduction, and eductions. So deduction means you have a fact and then you have a rule that you derive the new fact. Induction means you have the facts, but you want to find out their patterns or rule, uh, the rules. Abduction means you know the consequence, but you want to find out the reason why this consequence come out like that. So it is the opposite way of the deduction. Eduction means we get the same facts, but it implies different consequence. We wonder what would be the relationship between those different concepts. And we also have a different uh, conditions and they imply the same result. And then we wonder what is uh, those uh, conditions uh, are similar to each other or not. So similarity computation are there in place. Nowadays, by using artificial intelligence algorithms, all of those four different types of human thinking patterns have been implemented by different algorithms, such as uh, reinforced learning, and the deep learning models, CRN, RNN, and all of those different types of uh, learning models like uh, RSTM, like uh, GAN models, they all enforced this kinds of uh, human thinking pattern and uh, help us to make decisions. So why do we need to apply AI in ICU? And uh, that is a very, a difficult question. About 10 years ago, I asked uh, uh, one of the Australian academic, academicians and uh, his uh, professor in, in Melbourne University and his uh, top uh, com computer scientist. I talked to him, I said, how about we use AI technology in ICU? And he said, no, 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 don't do that. I said, why? He said, firstly, you don't have data. Secondly, the doctor probably not uh, uh, like to collaborate with you. Thirdly, the government probably doesn't allow you to do this kind of research because it is a life critical. Fourthly, it is a very difficult problem because uh, it is a matter of life and death. And uh, after that, I thought about uh, where, uh, and I still couldn't be convinced because those four problems about uh, you don't have data, doctor probably don't collaborate with you, the government doesn't uh, allow you to do the research and the research is so difficult, but no one of them is about if this research is meaningful, if this research can have a good, positive impact to our human life to save more lives and uh, or give a good impact to our society and do the third party opinions because we are facing a lot of uh, decisions. Here on the slide, I said, uh, for life critical decisions, there are two types of errors human expert may make. One is called a first positive, another one called a first negative. First positive means they give the false alarms. First negative means they ignore the pending dangers. So which kind of error you would prefer if you definitely will make some error? Are there any trade-off between different kinds of errors? And then we think first positive Errors means if this patient doesn't have a cancer, and then you say, oh, you get a cancer, 
And this patient got scared. And oh, no, 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 I'm scared, I'm dying. But if you do the double checking and the verification, and then that's okay, because that is an error we call the first alarms. But if you make a first negative error, you ignore the pending dangers and the consequence would be very serious. And then we should consider if there is a chance we will make a mistake, what kind of mistakes we would prefer? Okay, so in this context, we call the AI will provide the third party opinions in order to re uh, make a right predictions at the right time. We are not going to replace the doctors. We are not going to make a final decisions. I just want using AI technology to re research or to do the statistics on those millions of uh, ICU patients who went through the ICU. Why not we collect the and reduce their experiences. And uh, after I thought about this, about uh, eight years ago, I called uh, uh, the director of ICU in Royal Bristol Hospital. I said, uh, hi, Professor Lipman, can you, well, we, we like to do the collaboration with you to do the prediction in ICU to help your do your job or something like that. And he said, what, who you are? And why you want to, why you call me? What is the uh, purpose you are doing this research? I said, uh, how about we predict the mortality, uh, mortality of the person within the ICU? And then he said, who cares? Anyone coming through ICU, come to my place, they are dying person. Are you telling me I'm not going to save them? Or are you telling me this person is going to die in two hours? As long as this patient is alive, I will save his life, do my best until last second. And I was totally <laughs> lost. I, don't, I couldn't convince him to do the research with me. And then the telephone conversation was hung up. And after that, I thought uh, aware, I still couldn't uh, think about uh, why not we use AI? Because uh, I, my parents are all passed away in AI and I couldn't understand the, the terminology the doctors explained to me. I wish I could understand a little bit more. And doing AI research, I hope my expertise can be applied to AI, nothing wrong with that. And then I made another effort and I have a coffee break with him. And then this time I asked him a different question. I said, how about this situation? As a doctor who has 40 years experiences in the ICU, is that he has the same performance as a newly graduated uh, internship doctors. Are their performance would be the same or different? A new graduate doctors or a 40 years experienced doctors? And he said, of course not. We have a good experience. And uh, in doctor's uh, profession, the experiences are absolutely important. And we save life many times because we have good experiences. And at that moment, I check in, I said, okay, how about I using AI system to bring up those elderly, uh, older cases, past experiences to present those cases to the new doctors. And then you can look at it as what if, why not scenarios. And in this case, he said, can you do that? I said, yes, that is my 
uh, profession. I'm doing database retrieval, doing statistics, find out a similar patient and bring up the similar cases out of millions of the past uh, patients' records. And then present them, visualize them, and show you what kind of uh, lifetime spent within the ICU. And uh, then he said, okay, let me just introduce my deputy to you, and uh, you talk to him. And if there is a chance, we can do the collaboration, and then we do that. And then that is the beginning of our research in the ICU using AI in Australia. I think uh, I, my team is uh, one of the earliest one doing that research about 10 years ago. After that, we, we did a lot of uh, publications and also get uh, government funding and also many PhD students graduated uh, under this research topic. So UQ AI Collaboratory now is funding our team to do the research. And uh, we get an uh, aim of this proje project is to build a showcase to demonstrate how AI can be applied on a life critical real-time monitoring system for ICU patients with evidence-based decision support. And uh, we needed to give explanations, of course. And uh, this is the background. After we successfully teamed with the ICU in Royal Brisbane Hospital, we applied the government funding and that is 2014 to 2016. And this funding successfully granted and we finished this grant and also have a PhD students. As you can see, Chandra Yutomo is one of them. And the other students are already graduated. And because the COVID-19, I hope Chandra will graduate in one month or next month, so he's nearly finished <laughs> anyway. Okay, and then we have uh, 12 journal papers and uh, a lot of conferences papers. Chandra got a top conference paper as well. And uh, today's talk will introduce a little bit of his ideas in this, in my talk. And uh, there were some workshops hold on within the Queensland as well. And we discussed uh, the following issues. So those issues are already published by our research papers. And uh, I'm going to introduce a little bit of every one of them because this research is so big. So many people have been involved and a lot of uh, people are now doing this research in the world, including the American research labs, including Google and other IBM and many research institutes are doing ICU researches now. But our team is just one of the earliest one. And this is our research team before the COVID-19, okay. <laughs> and this is Chandra. We had a very good time in the Golden Coast. Okay, so the, our research team uh, many of them are already graduated, and uh, some of them, uh, Sun Wang and uh, Rock, and uh, also Tony, they are the lecturers in our school now. They are my colleagues now. And uh, as you can see from the screen, and uh, this is a list of uh, publications. And also include the changes of publications in the ISIS, which is a top conference. And we covered many of those three issues about bedside monitoring signal analysis. So there are 11 bedside monitors. They are time series data. And then we needed to analyze those time series data by the bedside of ICU. So there are some top conference and the journal papers. Secondly, ICU patient critical situation analysis and the visualization. We have a number of publications on that. And thirdly, ICU patient critical treatment review. And we needed to recommend some kind of options to doctors 
for them to do the decision making. And that is not an easy job. So it is a life critical. And we need to crunch the data and provide the options for doctors to make decisions. So that is the list of our work in the past uh, about uh, eight years in the past. So let's just go through a little bit uh, a technical aspect. It is a very general introduction on the tools we are using. The first thing is we needed to understand the data. So we needed to have data. Without data, we can, we can do nothing. So by using the data, we do the data fusion because they are in different structure, in different format, in different types of the values, and uh, even in different uh, uh, locations, such as uh, publications, health records, and the patient data. And then we needed to put them to together, unify them together to form up a knowledge graph. And that knowledge graph is a hierarchical structure, as you can see. And also we make the actual data record we call the patient drug disease. Patient drug disease data are available from those ICU data set. For example, one of them, we downloaded it from the United States. It's called the Mimic3. Now we are using, uh, Chandra is also using Mimic4 now. So there are many, many records within the ICU which are available, are available for us. So in addition to the knowledge graph, we needed to connect the abstract level to the instance level. So those actual records will be aligned with the concept and the attributes and those things. So we believe this kind of work is already published. We need to align with the actual patient records with the knowledge graph and make them as a mapping. And that would give the doctors not only retrieve the knowledge, but also find out the evidence to do the evidence-based medicine or evidence-based decision-making. Now we look at what is a MIMIC3 database. It is a huge, very big database. Many years of collecting of the ICU patients, 40,000 plus de-identified patient data, about more than 60,000 ICU stays. And then there are so many details and the data size, as you can see, 50 gigabytes for chat event data. And this is a huge collection of raw data recording the events happened within the ICU in seven years. And that is good as a start. We're using the AI technology to do that. And also, we have passed through the ethical approval to use Australian, New Zealand ICU data, intensive care uh, systems data. And in Isaac APD database, there are 2 million patient episodes. And there are 106 indicators. So this database collects episodes from over 90% of the ICU across Australia and New Zealand. It is a huge database. And we got ethical approval to use this database and for our PhD students and for our research. And we did our ex experiments based on those data in the past. And this is a structure of the MIMIC3 database schema. As you can see, by using the schema we call the metadata, we know what kinds of information is available for those individual patients. And uh, talking about diagnosis, talking about uh, treatment, talking about the symptoms of those ICU patients. 
And uh, this is a huge database. And uh, then, so what? What we can do with this database? And uh, firstly, we need to do something called the baseline. So when you measure the treatment, what is the good, what is the bad, what is the successful, what is the unsuccessful or failure? So we don't see this picture in this kind of way because this schema is for the data integrity. It's for relational database management. It's not good to see individual patients. So by using this data schema, we actually using another visualization space in this space, we call the problem space of ICU. We have one dimension about the time, another dimension about the individual patients, and another dimension is what we are going to do with this database. So previous database schema will be extracted from this database from record to record to reconstruct the reality. That means by viewing this database, we see the individual patient. We see the time point for the patient as such, such kind of treatment and as such, such kind of symptoms and the diseases and so forth. So we have a query on this database at a time point for those patients. And this is the understanding from the human expert view. And then we do the computation about a baseline. Uh, basically, it is a statistics about all of kind of distributions, the success rate, and uh, what is a normal pattern, what is outlier, and uh, this kind of thing. What outliers there are, what kind of trends, and uh, what kind of correlations. And if we do the baseline computation, and then, for each individual patient, as we see here, you can have a comparison of that patient to the baseline in order to help the doctors to make decisions. And the baseline construction is not an easy task. Baseline construction needed to be integrated with a lot of other kinds of databases like a cause of death database, like a EHR, your clinical databases, and even your gene data, because the genomics now is applied already to the, to the clinicals, and you use a GVAS algorithm to detect the diseases by using the genome data of a human being. And this is a new trend. So once we are doing the baseline construction, we probably will consider your gene data as well. And uh, this is about EHR database with the FHIR database. And the different countries may have a different format. I don't know what is the a standard format in Indonesia. I didn't find out the materials or information about in Indonesia. Probably later you can tell me, or we can discuss what is the hospital's uh, information systems, or uh, what kind of format, whether they are, you are using MetaView, MetaVision, or this kind of Philippus format or whatever. But uh, different countries, they have their own format. And uh, there is an international standard called the FHIR. And then we do the baseline computation. I'm not going to go details of this, what is a baseline computation. Anyway, baseline computation means we use uh, statistics to crunch the data, find out uh, the basic numbers, correlations, and so forth. And uh, there are some related work. And uh, Google has done that. And the international standard is called a uh, faster healthcare interoperability resource format. I 
believe probably Indonesia is also using this kind of format because it is an international standard. And uh, also there is a product called the common data model and uh, produced by Microsoft. And uh, as you can see, the Google has done some preliminary work in hospital mortality, 30 days unplanned readmission, prolonged length of the stay, and all of the other kinds of diagnosis. They are all available already. So we need to have those things in place before we can apply the AI technology. And now you can see this is a patient record for a specific patient ID9. So before we can do anything, we need to extract individual patients one by one from that database. And this is extraction of the patient with the patient ID. As you can see, there are different events. And also the doctor check the patient, make notes. And there are a lot of notes there available in, in plain English. And there are descriptions about this diagnosis data. And here is the one of the example of the notes, as you can see, radiology and the ID number CT is down. And then the doctors made some comments on the head CT and the dated at a certain time and make some recommendations. So what is the AI can be used here? What we are doing, we have some PhD thesis, automatically read the CT image and generate this paragraph automatically. Instead of a doctor actually spending time to read it, we generate a text paragraph to annotate the CT image. People would criticize me, say, oh, that is dangerous. How can we trust your AI program? I said that this paragraph generated is based on the scanning through the millions of previous images processed by doctors. And also we don't, we don't take a legal responsibility. We say this is a suggested, suggested text and the doctor needed to read it and change it and assign his name before this become official. So once the doctor signed this paragraph prepared by us, and then we will immediately do the learning based on this doctor's opinion. And we had a, a ARC linkage and it completed in last year and about uh, the how to automatically read the images. And now we look at uh, other examples. So a lot of uh, notes can be taken not only by the doctors, but also by the nurses or sisters. And then we needed to deal with those texts and uh, pick up the most critical phrases and then make alarm to the next shift of the doctors. And this is the, the record. I may need to speed a little bit up because there are a lot of details about the patients, patient records and so forth. Here, as you can see, this notes have a lot of information there. And uh, per patient, there are 15 reports. Every patient, 15 reports for every 24 hours. <coughs> and so what we can do? One of our project is to summarization and analysis of medical notes to discover the causal relationships. So we can analyze the nodes in progress and find out the final outcome or 
final result of that patient. And uh, to pick up those keywords, phrases, which are mostly contribute to the consequence of that patient. And uh, that would be better help for our doctors in future. And also we do the comparison with the doctor's notes and our machine made notes. And uh, that would give uh, a doctor's kind of what we call the third party opinions. <laughs> so we treat the notes in ICU as a natural language processing project is a very rich source. As you can see, there are 800,000 nursing notes on different aspects. And uh, in this case, there are 25 notes per patient for 24 hours. And uh, this is the process on how do we process the nature language writing notes. And uh, then that is from time to time. If there are six hours a shift, so you, every day there are four shifts. And uh, for every shift, the doctors and the nurses create the notes and then we do the reinforce the learning and those no, notes will be read by the next shift, the doctors or clinicians. And after that, this doctor will write the new one and so forth. And gradually we can see the change of the keywords. We can see the pathway, whether this patient is getting better or getting worse. <coughs> Excuse me. Before we started the research, I asked the doctors in ICU, I said, what is the most frequently asked questions in ICU? The doctor said, is he getting better or getting worse? From the doctors, they ask this to question, uh, question the patient or nurse asking the patient, or relative family members of the patient are asking doctors. They always asking this question, is he or he, she or he getting better or worse? So by answering this question, we use uh, artificial intelligence to process the notes and then to tell the patient whether it's getting better or worse. In order to do so, we do the unsupervised learning to group the features from the metadata verified by their patient records. And then for different circle here, they are the group, a group of features which contribute to a certain disease. And a different disease will involve a different group of features. And then we do the sorting or partitioning of those patients and then figure out the risks. And the different risks would happen at a different time period. And we can see that there are many, many features, but they are probably not equally important. Some of them are more critical. Some of them involve the time, we call the temporary. And then we use one example. This is one of our PhD search, uh, research thesis. And he finished this thesis already. In his PhD work, we do the prediction on the success scoring. So we call the illness severity scoring. And that is about uh, organ failure of the patient. So by using the bedside sensors, or we call the monitors, and uh, then we have a different monitors returning different uh, symptoms or signals. And then we summarize them into a score system. And this one, this red one, coming into the patient at time zero, that is admission of that patient very dangerously. So the higher, the worse is in the critical situation. But 
another patient coming into us, okay, just finishing a surgery. Along the time, one patient very critical may be survived. Another patient coming in okay, but finally dead. As you can see, along the development of his uh, symptoms within the hospital, we needed to do the prediction of this in real time. Currently, this computation is uh, summarized uh, manually uh, by a very simple statistic tool by the doctors, but we are going to use the tools to do the instant prediction in seconds, in other words. And this is the ICU scoring system. And there are different scoring systems. And so far scoring is to especially look after the sepsis disease, uh, organ failure disease. And as you can see, there are different levels, one, two, three, four levels. Okay, under the higher level, the worst situation. And then this part of research probably should be presented by Chandra. <laughs> this is his work anyway, I, I briefly presented. If you come to the hospital and if you give the, uh, what's called the, the antibiotics uh, for the prevention of the success, and then you can see, and the survival rate is very high. Okay, so if you present the, give them fraction, uh, the, the antibiotics later, that is hours. In the first hour or later hour, create, uh, if you provide a very antibiotics very lately, and the survival rate will become very low. So we should give them antibiotics as early as possible. And if you really do that, you introduce a new problem. One is the, if you, okay, you treated the sepsis, but uh, that same patient by using antibiotics, a lot of bacteria will be killed and then this patient may die by the pneumonia. Okay, so you deal with you deal with uh, deal with the uh, sepsis, but uh, you get a patient to die in, in pneumonia. And also, if everyone take the antibiotics, and the one doctor in a New York hospital may cost uh, this doctor two hundred thousand dollars unnecessarily a year per patient, and that is a too, a per doctor, and that is too much. So we need to find out the right time to give the right antibiotics, not to give antibiotics to everybody, because that will introduce another kind of death to patient. And this is the feature extraction. We do the sorting on the critical parameters. So there are different diseases. Every disease is matched with a different set of features, and we needed to do that automatically by using the learning method. So we call the evidence-based medicine here, and evidence the medicine means we want to build the trust between patients, doctors, and between all of those stakeholders, and also we needed to give explanations. And we don't have the intention to replace doctors. I keep saying that because otherwise our research will not be adopted by any organization. And this is what we are uh, considering in our research teams. For example, high order questioning is very important. What if it's challenging your conditions of your decision? Why not it's challenging your method in your decision. How about is challenging your applicability, applicability of your method? So what is challenging your, uh, the significance or purpose of your decision and so forth. So high order reasoning or questioning can be provided by us by using AI tools to help the doctors 
to reduce the first negative decisions. And this is my another research project by another PhD student. And uh, can I have uh, another 10 minutes? Probably too yes. much. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. It's fine. Okay, <laughs> too much. I, I thought there are more than 20 people's work I'm presenting. Okay. This one is talking about the causality because uh, causality is very important in the medicine research. And then it's just uh, using a single example here. And uh, there is a timeline here about the polio. That is a kind of a disease happened to the Africa people in a year. And also there is another happening or events that is called ice cream consumption. People eat ice cream at different times. The higher means the more people eating ice cream, but also the higher also have a portfolio. So if you check your database about polio and also ice cream consumption, you can see these two curves are correlated. Does that mean we take ice cream would cause the portfolio, uh, a polio disease? No. Why these two are think, do you think is uh, related to each other? Because of the weather. In general, not so many people taking the ice cream, but not so many people taking dirty waters. In August, because the weather is very hot and the, the water is not purified and the many child children taking the dirty water and uh, caught polio disease. At the same time, because of weather is very hot and many people buy the ice cream to eat ice, drink, uh, eat ice cream as well. So this correlation curve looks very similar, but they got nothing to do with each other. So in order to find out the causality, we needed to get rid of those kind of uh, correlations. So because we really needed to find out its, its cause, that is the weather, instead of uh, ice cream search. So that is the situation we needed to deal with. And then what do we do? We use these ideas to deal with the drug-drug interaction problem. In other words, we deal with the side effect. So if you have a pain in the stomach, we give you medicine and cure it. If you got a pain in the knees, and then we give you medicine to cure, to cure the knees, but you got a side effect, you got a headache. Although by taking that medicine. And then to cure your uh, headache, we give you another medicine and uh, then cure your headache. That is just a side effect. And then you need to take two drugs to cure the knees because of the side effect here. What happens if I have both? My stomach is pain, my knees is pain. And then what kind of drugs you should take? And the drug drug interaction costs a lot of injuries every year. And there are 231,000 injuries because of the side effect. And the 30,000 death caused by side effect. So, what are we trying to do? We download this FDA data set and try to find out the causalities between the different drugs, if uh, combinations of different drugs would cause the side effect. So there are different number of patients and uh, you taking the drugs, whether this drug cure the disease or not. And uh, then we have the statistics. And uh, then we construct the consequence by using a Bayesian network. And then for those irrelevant variables, we eliminate them. Finally, we find out the side effect. 
by work out the causality of this uh, data set. And then we discovered some new side effect in our students' work. And then by checking with the doctors, and this is the side effect not recorded within the medical doctor's uh, textbook. And then we say, okay, this is our new contribution for this kind of uh, knowledge discovery by our PhD student. And now this is uh, Changer's work. So what uh, he's doing, his PhD is to do reinforce the learning, take the bad side monitors data, do the prediction and offer the recommendations to, do, to, do, to doctors and the doctor consider the recommendations and uh, specify or prescript the treatment. And then we do the another observations and so forth. And uh, that reinforced the learning would be awarded by the correct decisions. And uh, this is the idea. So we use the pre data, pre-recorded time series data for first 10 hours to predict uh, what will happen in the next hour to each patient? And by using multiple time series data, and they are all bedside monitor data. As we can see from the data set, there are 11 time series, 11 variables, all bedside monitors by the data. So what? At the any time point, if the doctor coming in this time point, what would happen? For each of these variables, the doctor would say two possible values, normal, abnormal. Normal or abnormal for a single variable may take two variables, but another variable will take another normal or abnormal values. So for 11 variables, each one of them will have two possible outcome values at a certain time point. That means the total number of possible situations a doctor is facing beside the bedside of that patient is two power two is 11. That is 2,048 possible situations for that doctor to make a decision. Immediately, when you look at this situation, there are 2,048 possible situations. For each one of them, you need to know what is the recommended treatment in the next time period. And that is a big challenge for doctors. How can you know all possible solutions for those 2,048 possibilities in a second. And that is the challenge we are facing. Of course, sometimes the doctor do the feature selection. They don't care other features. They only consider your blood pressure, your breath, and your heartbeats, for example. And that is just to take three of them, for example. That is possible. But in general, we have a lot of situations which may be uh, sensitive to take those, all of the 11 sensors for the patient. And this is the scenario we are dealing with. So for all patients, there are 11,000 patients. And also some of the patients that got a success. And 5,000 of them got a success. And there are 6,000 of them not have a success. And also there are some deaths. And then we needed to consider how can we prescribe the antibiotics timely for the doctors? And I believe Chandra has done very, very good job. And one of the paper already published. And I actually presented you a number of ICU sections in Chinese hospitals last year. 
And uh, many doctors said, oh, this is a fantastic approach. We should really consider the real use of this approach. So this is a brief uh, introduction on using Chandra's method. And uh, for example, we only have uh, three different time series. And uh, this is a uh, blood pressure. And also we have a respirate, respiratory, right? That is a breath. And also another time series, that is a mental status. So we have three time series. Each one of them have a threshold, top or the bottom. In other words, good or bad or something like that, we use a threshold to detect they are okay or not. So for three time series, good or bad, normal or abnormal, we would have eight different possible status, two power to three equals eight. And uh, what we do for eight status, we draw eight nodes in our graph and uh, plus two more survived and the uh, death. And then the transition of each of those nodes is the measure of its uh, scoring, success scoring. And the age indicates the prescriptions given by doctors. So at state five, doctors prescribed some kind of treatment. And then the next state would be S1, another score level one. As you can see, this kind of eight transactions may disjoin. That means whether you are getting into this circle, the patient may likely die. In another circle, the patient may survive. And then we, we are looking at the prescriptions transitions, we want to make a successful transitions for every one of them, because this is on the age status. In future, we would need to consider 11, uh, the status, uh, 11 sensors for all of them, and that is the PhD thesis level. So for publication, for explanation, convenience, we just give eight status here for explanation. And uh, one of my PhD students uh, is graduating now. He has a final submission recently. And uh, his work is to find out the similarity of the patient within the ICU in the, along the timeline. I'm not going to dwell in details. This is the whole lot of PhD research on finding the similar patient. Some people may tell me, say, hey, why not we use ICD-10? ICD-10 coding can give a patient a kind of grouping. And also there's another protocol called the DRG protocol. And the DRG protocol also is to group a patient into uh, different groups for different uh, treatment purpose. But this PhD research is not to do that level. That level is too high. Doesn't help for us to make a, individual personalized uh, treatment recommendations. So we needed to go to the very specific independent individual patient level to find out the most similar one, not just by DRG, not just by ICD-10 coding, okay? And this is another one for recovery of the patient by one of my PhD students as well and she finished uh, her PhD as well. So if you've ex successfully exceeded from the ICU, how can we recover you by the best way to help this patient to do the recovery? And then we use deep learning, crunch the records and so forth. So currently my project on ICU AI ICU is to do the demonstration using uh, as if a real dashboard system to help the doctors 
and we call the showcase system. And then we use this uh, plan and which will be finished in the early 2023 or end, uh, hopefully we can finish at the end of uh, next year. And uh, we have uh, at least five people uh, intensively to do this kind of job. Okay, so this is my conclusion. We are doing a showcase based on our publications, based on our PhD thesis. And uh, we hope this can be adopted for the trials. And uh, that uh, trial or clinical trial may cost another five years. I know this is a long story. <laughs> Using AI in ICU is still a long way to go. But I know before I am in the ICU, I hope this system will be <laughs> available before I die. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, my presentation. And uh, thank you very much. Wow. Thank you very much, Professor Shuli. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of opportunities, uh, a lot of challenges, and also uh, a lot of possible contribution that we can give uh, using artificial intelligence in intensive care. Yeah. We can yeah. do data management and interoperability. We can do time series analytics, natural language processing, and also knowledge uh, discovery. Okay, uh, I will give opportunity if uh, any of the participants uh, have any question? Want to want to give uh, questions? Please, uh, you can raise your hand. Okay. Maybe we can we can give opportunity to Dr. Mulyadi, Pak Chandra. Okay. Uh, doctor from from hospital. Okay, Dr. Mulyadi first. Hello, Dr. Mulyadi. Yeah. Uh, do you have any comment or questions or want to have collaboration directly <laughs> about this one? <laughs> so Dr. Mulyadi is a general director of VRC Hospital. Maybe have problem with the microphone. Hello, Dr. Muryadi, are you there? Kecil suaranya ya, Pak Chandra ya? Ya, suaranya kecil. Oke. Halo. Uh, nah, udah, udah, udah. Pak ya sekarang bisa Pak? Sudah, sudah jelas sekarang. Oke, okay, uh, okay. good morning Indonesia Times, uh, Prof. Shuli. Uh, nice have to meet you. Nice uh, uh, really, uh, today I invite many participants from uh, our medical doctors to attend your presence today. Uh, as a hospital practitioner, uh, I think what have your presence is uh, is interesting because uh, we could be manage our patient is correctly with the data. Data. So. Uh, uh i think uh but the 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 content of what has you present is really so sophisticated by myself so i am i'm not clear understand yet uh about the system but i think uh what do you think uh how to make the simple thing uh we could be to implementing anything related to data in a hospital uh, could be manage as a uh, resources to to could be 
uh, advanced management for our treatment of the patient. Thank you, Mr. Shirley. Yes, thank you. Thank you for Mariate uh, from doctor uh, from hospitals. I think uh, the simple thing is uh, we can do the summarization. A summarization for all possible situations to help doctors to make uh, uh, less uh, mistakes or uh, make doctors aware of the pending dangers. And we call the baseline. And the baseline means for every patient, we needed to know statistically the survival rates between the different doctors, between different diseases. And uh, this is not uh, the textbook baseline. Textbook text baseline is too general. We needed to understand the, the performance of uh, each doctors and uh, each hospitals and each ICU. And also we are making this baseline to compare the survival rates because of different situations. If you talk about COVID-19 and the different patients from different country may have a different survival rate. And then that baseline of COVID-19 survival is very specific. And then we need to make every case comparable. For example, the COVID-19 uh, patient with the uh, AIDS or without AIDS, and the AIDS patient in South Africa or AIDS patient in China, the, their COVID-19 survival rate is uh, different. Mm -hmm. And uh, not every doctor remember that, knowing that, or referring that when they make decisions. So at least we can provide uh, a hospital, a kind of uh, a baseline summary and uh, to show you can do better than average, something like that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Xiu. Thank you. Maybe uh, really I have the other colleagues uh, attending in the participants, uh, one of chairman of intensive care unit of the RC hospital, Dr. Henry, maybe you could have any question for Mr. Xiu. Uh, okay, uh, thank you uh, the, for the time. Uh, Prof, I'm Dr. Henry, I'm the intensivist. I'm also the anesthesiology and uh, the, uh, head of the uh, department of ICU. Uh, in ICU, uh, we have like a, a scoring for, it, it's like this. Uh, yeah. We know that actually many ICU patients outside ICU, but we don't notice, or we are noticed until the patients uh, become getting worse and caught blue. And we have like a scoring system. We call it the early warning system. Yeah. Yep. It's like to, to make an aggregate score, it's like maybe like seven parameters, like heart rate, yeah, uh, respiratory yeah. rate. Yeah. And then we aggregate the score and then we make like a, a assumption if the score is like increasing and this patient can become getting worse. So yeah. uh, I think, um, uh, what do you think about this? Is there any like related with the uh, AI? I mean, uh, can we use this score to make simplify uh, like uh, we're doing in, in uh, artificial, uh, artificial intelligence? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, ICU scoring is uh, very uh, much uh, complicated and uh, that scoring system is based on a number of parameters and uh, there are different uh, scoring, uh, scoring systems used by different hospitals even for different diseases or for different types of the patients and uh, you, as you can see there are Apache, SAPS and uh, MPN and uh, SAPS and uh, so far, so far scoring. And uh, what we are doing is to avoid this kind of uh, artificial, uh, avoid the human selected features because the human selected features are small, a smaller number and computed every three or four hours. What we are doing is to integrate all of them to do the automatic feature selection. 
and make, make them like this so far is for organ failure, to make them all integrated together and then do the prediction in real time. And in real time means we can instantly show you if this patient by second by second is getting better or getting worse. And also predicting the next hour. And as, uh, as you can see, the changes work. By using previous 10 hours, we're predicting what would happen in next hour. And hopefully we can give you the early alarm because we can chase, we can check hundreds of thousands of millions of the patients from the database available from the Mimic3 or Isaac IPD Australian data set. If in future we can get Indonesian uh, ICU data, we would uh, be able to integrate those prediction algorithms with the Indonesian personalized data. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Frost. Thank you. Yeah, I think it will be nice if we can give a valuable prediction or summarization or treatment evaluation to the hospital. And I think it's also, it will be interesting if we can be the first or number one <laughs> to, to implement this in Indonesia. What do you think, Dr. Mulyadi? <laughs> And uh, Dr. Siapa tadi? Mohon maaf, Kepala ICU. Dr. Henry. Dr. Dr. Henry. Dr. Henry. Ya, mungkin kita bisa diskusi lebih lanjut ya kalau tertarik untuk huh? implementasi ini. Yep. Uh, any other question? Maybe we can have one more time for questions. One more question. Yes, Pak Chanda. Yeah. Maybe, uh, uh, Suli, maybe the problem in Indonesia is about the data itself, because uh, maybe unlike uh, Australia or America, we we have a strict, or, or what, what we call it, we have a strict ethics about patient data. That's why maybe like Chandra, it's difficult to find the real data from Indonesia, right? Pak Chandra, and yes, he has, uh, he has he has to import the data from Australia or maybe from America. Uh, maybe you can uh, you can suggest us how we can resolve this kind of issue. Uh, thank you, Yumi. I think I, this question is uh, very important. And uh, recently, I proposed uh, another research grant, uh, and uh, I call it a data plus. Data plus means we need to deal with the data for the training very seriously. So we call this uh, from the three different uh, from three different possibilities. Uh, firstly, we have a, a small sample. So you don't have too many cases, but we have at least one case for one kind of uh, uh, disease. Uh, for example, if I ask you by how many cases you needed to know the alias, right? One case is good enough to know what is alias, right? <laughs> aliens uh, from out space. <laughs> so, if we can have a small number of samples, at least one, and then we can use a GAN model. In deep learning, there is a GAN model, generative adversarial network to create other kinds of data set. So in other words, if you give me a very small number of samples, I can artificially create a sample data to do the training. This is the first possibility. Secondly, we call it uh, federated learning. Federated learning means you don't have to share your data with me, but I give you my program. You run my program on your hospital, in your organization, and then that algorithm will create some features extracted from your data 
and then subject to your uh, uh, security screening. So whether you happy or not to share that features in, in, instead of individual human data, you share the features with me, but I provide you the algorithm in your hospital, run your uh, database and then, but uh, algorithm is uh, called uh, deep learning, federal data learning algorithm. And uh, if that is okay, and then we can share the features of your data instead of the real data. This is a second solution. The third solution is called the transferred learning. They are all come from the deep learning. Transferred learning means we have the MIMIC3 uh, models already trained in American data. And also we have Australia Isaac APD data and uh, then we train our models. And then we get the model already okay within American data, within Australian data. And then we get the knowledge graph that is a metadata from the Indonesian hospital. Once we get the metadata, why not? We do the, we call the no noise injection, perturbation of the noises according to the statistics on the Indonesia data. We can artificially transfer the learned model from the mimic three Australian data model to the Indonesia data model. And then we do the evaluation after that. So we call that this is a data three solution. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, very interesting. Yeah. So with the transfer learning, we we don't have to to have a lot of data for training, right? Because we all we did the training with the previous data available data. Yes. That's right. If you look at my Google Scholar or yep. my 2021 uh, publication, one of our paper is called the source data free, zero. Oh, I see. <laughs> zero, I said zero data. We can still do the transfer learning. So source if you go to provide me Indonesian data, we can transfer the learned model from mini yeah. three to the Indonesia uh, hospitals. Yep. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I think we have a lot of insights, a lot of uh, guidance for the next steps. And hopefully we can uh, collaborate with the YARC hospital to implement this AI in intensive care units and also yeah. be the pioneer in Indonesia to, <laughs> to make an uh, intelligent hospital to save, uh, to help doctors saving more life. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor thank you. for excellent talk. Uh, thank you, partis uh, participant. Yeah. Please complete the questionnaire to provide comment, suggestion, and get the certificate of attendance. Uh, the link is in the chat. Uh, Shuli, thank you very much for your time. Your thank report. you, bro. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, ladies and thank gentlemen. You, uh, thank you, your university. Thank yeah. you, everyone. Yeah. Bye bye. 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 All the participation, uh, thank you for your attendance and participation. See you again in the next uh, AI seminar, hopefully. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Pak Chandra nanti yang menghubungi Suli ya. Ya. Thank you semuanya. Terima kasih semua. Bye. Dr. Mulyadi, Bapak Ibu Dokter dari Rumah Sakit, terima kasih. Pak Chandra. Ya, terima kasih, Dokter Mulyadi. Pak Chandra, ya. sebenarnya yes. apa yang disampaikan uh, Bu Dekan tadi, uh, kalau data di rumah sakit itu kan udah ada, kita kan bermain dari objektif data ya. sebagai database, katakanlah dari, dari data laboratorium, data uh, radiologi, data-data hmm. yang sebagai baseline data. Ya. Baseline data itu yang di, diterjemahkan sebagai satu proyeksi daripada satu kondisi kesehatan yang akan terjadi gitu lah. Hmm. Kemarin saya coba ngobrol sama Dr. Henry gitu lah kan. Katakanlah dengan misalnya pasien dengan kondisi 
kondisi sepsis saat ini misalnya sepsis. Nah, ketika kita mempunyai data leukositnya sekian atau asam laktatnya sekian, ini akan mem memberikan prediksi outcome yang lebih uh, buruk uh, sehingga kita bisa memberikan data untuk informasi kepada pasien kita keluarga. Di ya. satu sisi kita juga sebagai database untuk melakukan intervensi ketika gambaran kalkulasi dari ininya akan memberikan satu outcome yang lebih getting worse daripada ya. nah, mungkin ini ini bisa dimanfaatkan Pak karena menurut saya data itu data objektif semua yang ada kita lakukan gitu. Iya. Dan itu bisa bisa untuk riset Pak. Sudah ready untuk risetnya. Iya. Oke. Okay. Iya. Bisa sekali, bisa sekali. Oke, okay, sip. Mungkin nanti ini dok kita juga perlu ketemu prof jurnalis juga soal data itu kan karena kemarin yang agak sensitif soal data kan prof jurnalis ya yang, ini, yang takut ini, ada ini apa ini bukan bukan data data apa namanya bukan data yang berhubungan dengan uh, pasien uh, bukan merupakan satu data apa ya namanya data tambahan tapi data objektif yang ada hasil laboratorium hmm. hasil apa okay. gitu nah, data okay. itu kita entry secara kalkulasi berdampak pada suatu prognosis dan sebagainya gitu lah. Hmm. Jadi hmm. ya, insyaallah bisa tuh. bisa tuh Pak Chandra tuh. Siap. <laughs> Oke, okay, ini uh, Taufik tolong di-stop aja recording-nya. <laughs> Jangan minta tolong okay. di-streaming. Makasih ya uh, Pak Chandra, okay. Dok. Terima kasih Dr. Dr. Ya. Mulyadi. Nanti <laughs> mungkin saya kontak Dr. Mulyadi sama Dr. Hendri tadi ya kalau terkait ya. IC ya tadi ya. Mungkin okay. kita boleh duduk, Pak. Iya. Masih jalan? Masih kok? <laughs> nah, ini ya? Iya, kayaknya kalau pakai jaringan DRC mungkin agak ini ya. Dokter Mulyadi pakai DRC kan? Iya. Nah, udah tuh, udah tuh dok. Ya. Tadi terputus dok. Ya, mungkin saya sih uh, lebih baik kapan-kapan kita duduk offline gitu lah. Oke, okay, siap. Roaming untuk uh, ke di sini Pak gitu lah. Ya. Saya, saya main ke rumah sakit berarti ya? Iya, <laughs> udah clean, udah green zone kok. Oke, okay, siap. Apa nanti kan sama profesionalis mau dikasih satu space khusus buat AI di rumah yeah. sakit. <laughs> okay, siap, Makasih siap. ya dok. Makasih okay, Pak Chandra. Uh, ya. Yeah. 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 Yeah.